you very much. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Andreas Binner, CTO of Rideware, and I'd like to talk to you today about the rising complexity in car HMIs. So we all already had a lot of presentations today. Jet lag kicks in for all Europeans, including me now, so I thought I'd spice up the topic in a little bit more entertaining way. Also, I have to say, Alexander from Mercedes took away a little bit my idea because I'm also going to uh, want to do a time travel with you guys. So let's get back on the right, back to the 80s. Ronald Reagan is elected to the President of the United States. The brand new channel MTV is playing Video Kills the Radio Star in an endless loop. Microsoft recently just uh, released its brand new software called Word. And the Time magazine makes the computer the man of the year. And everybody wants to have a car like Kit from Knight Rider. So, however, if you look at the cars from the 80s, um, the, it's far less spectacular. Um, actually, the operation is still analog. So if you look how a cockpit looked like, we all remember plastic needles in the speedometer, just a few tiny lamps showing uh, up in the instrument cluster. When it came to infotainment, your choice was singing along to a radio, and when it came to navigation, hopefully your passenger was able to read the map. So that was at the time, and if you had a cassette deck or a sunroof, that was already premium. And of course, in the 80s, the cigarette lighter, I think, was the most ordered um, uh, extra. I can remember my parents all smoking in the car. So very analog, um, H&I inputs, handles, sliders, knobs, all that stuff. So fairly easy. But of course, time stands still. So let's go to the 90s. East and West Germany get reunited. European Union gets founded. Friends is the most popular sitcom on television. And electronic toys like Furbies and Tamagotchis hit the children's room. PCs are suddenly get connected to the thing called the internet. So the information age has begun. But if you look at the car, not really much groundbreaking stuff has happened still mostly analog. Um, I think the biggest news here was um, the cassette deck was replaced by the CD player, and the air conditioning maybe replaced the sunroof that you could open. But otherwise, there's not much new going on. Um, not yet, because now it's starting and there is no looking back. The new millennium. The new New Year's Eve 2000 went by, and the Y2K bug did not cause the world to crash, so we figured digitalization is, can no longer be stopped. So that we had 9-11, and the decade after that was the fight against terror. The decade ends in a recession, um, triggered by the financial crisis. Meanwhile, China is not impressed and is rising, enjoys rapid economic growth. Facebook rises. And social media becomes a mass phenomenon. YouTube paves the way to video streaming. And the Apple iPod changed the way we consume music. So now, let's take a look what's happening here. So cars are still a self-contained bubble, but vehicle electronics and software are on the rise and become a, become a thing, suddenly. So mobile phones had a rapid adoption rate. There was this genius idea to simply convert the cigarette lighter into a 12-volt socket by just renaming it. That was quite inventive. But the biggest thing that happened here at that time was the first ADAS, or actually just driver assistance systems, not advanced at the time, and the first navigation map services show up. So we see first screens with GPS navigation and things like adaptive cruise control, ele electronic stability control show up in the car. And these two areas became also their own domain, basically, navigation and ADAS. We have another conference next door about that. So um, also in that decade, the iPhone launched, and the global mobile data networks were growing. So it was clear we are all connected all the time, everywhere. In the 2010s, now it's really 
the curve is going up that you see here, which is the complexity. Um, so basically, software has its own status in the car. HUDs show up, the first digital clusters, IVI screens are the new normal in the center. They host navigation, car settings, um, entertainment, of course, and the new popular rear cameras show up. So the, the cockpits are also equipped with the first digital services, like we had real-time traffic coming directly from the cloud. And smartphones started to be integrated more seamlessly. I think 2014, Apple introduced CarPlay. And it's kind of a must-have feature to have mirroring like CarPlay and Android Auto in the car today. Also, touch and voice was introduced. We just heard from Mercedes what big role that plays. And also the communication in the car. I mean, we're all used to messages and emojis, Twitter, Insta. So that's all in. The curve goes even further. Oops, wrong button. So like today, all our cockpits are huge command centers with an app for almost everything. Everything is around an surrounded by an ecosystem of mobile devices and cloud data. Also globalization, climate change bring new use cases to the car and also new regulations. We just heard also the rise of electric cars brings new use cases for e-charging. Then personalization, localization services, also, the first AI gets into the car, and with each hardware generation, it gets more and more complex. Rear cameras become 360 degrees cameras. ADAS level one becomes two, and so on. So the curve is really going up. In the future, probably we will have a busy time in harmonizing and optimizing all these new features and the non-standard technologies integration of screens, ECUs, merging of data, cars get connected to IoT, the Internet of Things. Augmented reality will bring data in line with the real world. And we also think more sustainable car becomes become upgradable via software, becomes a big thing, and that also means our software architectures are more modular. So we have seen now on this journey um, since also car software is a relatively new field, it's probably the most complex area as an engineer you can be in. The costs for HMI development have literally exploded. Um, and just in the last decade, just think of it, in 2013, just 10% of the functions were based on software, and pretty soon it's half of the functions in the car. So, just to back that up a little bit, I was looking around and I find something about this complexity. So if we compare like modern applications or operating systems with, um, with, with a modern car and the software in the car, I mean, you can easily see that it tops things like macOS or any, anything like that. So what does it all mean for the driver, this complexity? I think we are currently in a situation I would call the automotive HMI triangle. So the world around is getting more complex, mega city, traffic, communication overflow, that's one corner. Then the cars we have seen get more complex. So it's quite intimidating if I think, if I imagine my parents sitting in one of the Mercedes we have just seen, I think it's really intimidating. And in the last corner we have us, and I think our brains haven't undergo such rapid evolution than the technology, so we are kind of lacking behind a little bit here. And how we want to tackle that, I think HMI, and we actually have seen it in some other talks, play, plays a very important role. So for us, it's function and value, and we just heard in the previous talk also the term, no, it was the looks of talk, seamless, so seamless assistance. So currently, more is not always better. Maybe quantity is easy, but quality is not. So we believe functional value means that a certain feature fulfills a customer need and serves a purpose in order to find a way into an HMI. So functional value means that design is not just eye candy, but it conveys a valuable meaning. 
So user interfaces still need to follow ergonomic principles, consider situational context, we also heard that, the attention spans and um, uh, processing capabilities of humans. But just let's remember what HMI stands for, human machine interface. So we believe HMI needs to help the drivers to deal with the complexity of the machine, and that's the car. For seamless assistance, um, most of the most beloved features in a car fall in that category, and it's functional value as its best. There are so many small features you, you don't want to miss anymore, like rain sensing wipers, dynamic volume control, blind spot detection. These are features you don't even realize anymore. You just miss them when you sit in a car where they're not in anymore. And I think that's the best functional value and seamless assistance you can have if you reach that state. So maybe enough of the uh, theory. So I brought three HMI use cases. We at Rival Relief in the next years and decade will well, gain mass market adoption. Some of them you have seen maybe around in premium cars or, or prototypes um, that really deliver a functional value to the driver. First, advanced surround view. I mean, one out of five um, accidents happening in parking lots, about 200 people get killed by backup crashes in the US every, every year. So the use of cameras, of course, saves lives. It's nothing new. Um, knowing what's around your car is a safety relevant thing. We know we had rear cameras and surround view, but it goes further and further, and we already see nowadays high quality three rendering that is merged with, with video images so the driver takes kind of a meta perspective. So that's already there in premium cars, but I think it becomes, uh, we think it becomes more and more standard. So we will all see that in the mid 2020s. And let's have a short video. So that's where kind of an extreme example of a surround view with a with Kanzi rendered 3D model that even casts shadows on the on the on the street here and reflections. So this this type of 3D surround view needs very little abstractions. So everybody understands that. You don't need to explain it, you see it, it's easy to grasp, it's what you see, is what you get, basically. And it's also a very enjoyable feature. And let's just watch the to an end. So that's basically hyper-realistic video seamlessly integrated with, with a 3D model of a car. Next, 3D animated ADAS, sometimes called ADAS view or confidence view. So today, 96% of new vehicles have at least one ADOS feature. And uh, drivers embrace these features. But we all know ADOS features are easier to envision than to implement. So current systems don't always make perfect. And in fact, actually, up to level two, um, the driver has to monitor the system. But we also believe um, with level three plus, where in theory you could lean back, it is very beneficial to earn the trust for the system that you can see what the car is seeing. I think it will be there for quite a while. I just got from a colleague today a story about the lift boy. At the beginning, it was necessary to push the buttons, but then well, he wasn't necessary anymore, but he stayed in the, in the elevators um, just to give the people the feeling there is still a human being doing something although it wasn't needed anymore. So it's same here. I think it's very has a very deep functional value for probably many decades that you see what the environment model of the car is seeing and convey that in a in a nice way. And also that's probably coming at the end of this decade. Also have a nice video on that. So we see nice Rendering of all objects 
uh, around you with a reduced visualization that makes the driver easy to understand. You could even see that you can zoom in and out from the navigation view to something that's really showing what's around you, what's around you and giving you the confidence that the car has detected a truck or a pedestrian or anything like that. Over time, we will see more and more accurate um, in environmental data that can be displayed here. Again, reduced to something that has value for the, for the driver to build also the trust. Last but not least, um, augmented reality, maybe a little bit further away. So projecting essential information in the driver's field of view is, of course, uh, is obviously it's a very seamless assistance you can have. And we also seen that number three uh, cause of pedestrian um, injuries um, is the distraction. So eyes on the street is, is the thing. So concentrate on the road and contributing to higher safety by putting all the information you need directly where you can relate to it. So there could be instructions for navigation or warnings or anything like that. Um, so let's also look at a small video how that could look like. But first of all, I think for the video, I like to say that's probably taking a little longer, also due to the, um, to the required complex hardware you need. Currently, we have had up this place with a very small uh, field of view. But we believe in the coming years that will widen more and more up to project in all of the uh, windshield. Also, there's a variant of augmented reality where it's not um, projected to the windshield, but um, projected over a front camera video on a, on a screen. So there are two variants to that. So, so that is for something that is projected to the windshield, the distance to the car. It could show you with green lines when it's that you can do the, the lane change directly where you need it. I like that one, I call it the, the street carpet. In complex city situations, there is just no ambiguity anymore of where to go. Um, and of course, you can also warn for dangerous situations by marking here pedestrians and things like that. So that are the three use cases we kind of see coming that use 3D, and that's the core of our company, but really um, bring a functional value to the driver, really helps with the complexity and not is just adding to the comp complexity. So last but not least, but that would be probably a talk on its own, but I, of course, since our product is also a tool chain, I want to mention it. So far, I already talked about the complexity in the car for the driver, but obviously there's a complexity in HMI development too. Um, there's an overwhelming pile of new functions and technologies every day, so many of you will know that. Um, everybody who designs, integrates, and implements HMIs knows that from every day. And so automotive software development has a, has a huge, huge scope, so I tried to find a chart on that and I found this little mean one from McKinsey, but everybody who is in automotive can relate to that. So how the complexity in the software has risen, and then it compares it to automotive and other tech areas. So like tech leaders in web development are dealing a little bit better with, with that, but they also have a little advantage. They can rely on protocol standards like HTML, CSS, and protocols like HTTP and all sorts of editors that are around. Mobile app developers have also an advantage here because they basically got mandated SDKs and tools from the ecosystem owners. So iOS and Android, Google, Apple, they just give you the tools and everything and you just have to follow it. But um, it seems every automotive HMI project struggles with its own target hardware, individual OS platform, various middleware, and data interfaces. So there are many concepts to solve that problem and initiatives to overcome that. 
Today, I just like to present one great solution, and that's now the last slide and the sales pitch. Of course, Kanzi from Rightware is such a tool chain, and one way to increase all this productivity is a tool chain to select a tool chain that supports automotive workflows, many target platforms, safety and security standards. Kanzi is such a tool, and if you guys are interested in that, visit us at the table. I'm happy to talk to you guys about that. And that's it from my side. Thank you very much. <laughs>